And the reason that YouTube has taken over Netflix and Hulu and every other streaming platform is because it's real life happening and it's much easier to connect with the people that you see on camera because they're real people as opposed to ads. Hey, Jordan, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. How are you? It's good. It's good. Unless, of course, you know, you are, uh, you know, you don't love uh, the terrible weather in New York City, right? For people watching, I know that I say this like every X of weeks, you know, for people watching uh, that is terrible in terms of weather, but it is what it is in New York. So I hope that in, in your case, it's, it's a bit better. But for New York uh, these days, it's been quite horrible. But with that said, uh, cannot complain. And so, Jordan, you know, like to, to know a bit more about our guests, usually we do this thing called a map. So basically, it's divided in three different sections, and the map is the mission. So what do you aim to achieve, right? The achievements, and if they're really proud of, in terms of notable milestone, could be your career or could be your life. And the last one is the purpose. So why do you do what you do? So I've had three installments of careers. I was a baseball player in college. Then I was an actor, uh, photographer, and now I do YouTube. And I realized with acting, with photography, and YouTube, there's one thing consistent, and that is storytelling. So I really love to tell stories. So when I did photography, um, I, was, I was using dancers to construct everyday moments, but to make them beautiful through dance. So there's a lot of storytelling through photos, and then I advanced to storytelling through YouTube and through video content. So I think that's the main thing that drives me is a good story. And I've found different areas to do that. First, I was on camera as an actor, then behind the camera with photography, and now I've gone on camera again. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, in all these different uh, life, right, like different lives that you live so far, you know, so actor, you know, photographer, now YouTuber, what are the biggest achievements uh, that you got in the past, I don't know, like 10 years or so? A lot. I've been very fortunate. If we start with photography, I had two best-selling books, two photography books that were bestsellers internationally. That's not easy to do, especially for photography books. Then coming to YouTube, we, we have amassed 25 million subscribers. We just won a Nickelodeon Kids Choice Award. And we are in, you know, the top couple of hundred YouTube channels in terms of monthly views. Out of 60 million YouTube channels that are currently active, we've made it to the top hundred. So that is remarkable. And we feel very, very fortunate to be there. Fantastic. And uh, what's your purpose? Uh, let's put the like now the, the life as a YouTuber, right? Uh, why do you, uh, you know, why do you do what you do? I have... A lot of different reasons, but the main one is to spread joy. Uh, actually, this is my first book. <laughs> so that's like, and it says, a celebration of joy in the everyday. So even from back, at, this was in 2016, I think, or 2012, somewhere there. Uh, ever since then, I've been using my art to spread joy, to make people laugh, to make people think, make people feel something, give them a perspective on life they might not have had otherwise through storytelling. And the second reason I do what I do is I get to spend every week with my family. Uh, my daughter and I work uh, together to make videos. My son is also often in those videos, so is my wife. So when I was doing photography, I was away a lot. And now I am with them all the time. And that's one of the reasons why I love the direction that my YouTube channel has gone so much is because it allows me to spend so much time with them. Fantastic. And, you know, tell me a bit more about, you know, in front of the camera as an actor, then behind the camera, right? Uh, uh, as a photographer, now back again in front of the camera. When you went from like professional photographers to becoming a YouTuber, was it planned? Uh, is it something that happened? Like, you know, were you testing things out and then kind of exploded? Did it take like a, lo a long time? Like, tell me a bit more like, how was that sort of like a you know, period and, and shift uh, from the photography to YouTuber? Uh, headshots as a photographer, plus simultaneously making books. And I had a book, at, and so uh, I had a partner, uh, Sandy, who's still, still the production uh, partner up for me. He would make videos for me because I was doing photography of dance. So he would come out and he would just film and we would put them on Vimeo back in the day, not even YouTube. Oh, yeah. And at one point, my, he and my son both suggested that we try posting them on YouTube. I didn't know anything about these things. Like, why would we do that? But I did have a book coming up the following year. So I thought, well, if we could get possibly 10,000 subscribers, I had no idea how we'll do that. But if we can get 10,000, then that might help us promote the book. So we started doing the occasional video on YouTube. To, I, had, I had no idea you could even monetize YouTube. I didn't know what trends were. I couldn't name a single YouTuber. We just started doing <laughs> photography challenges and posting them on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And when I came up with something called a 10-minute photo challenge, 
which basically meant I'm going to bring a dancer to the middle of New York City. I'm going to give myself 10 minutes, see how many cool shots I can get. As soon as we came up with that formula, it really went pretty viral right away. And I was unaware that that was even a difficult thing to do. I was just, well, that got 100,000 views and we have 10 subscribers. How did that happen? And we just kept building on that success. And so my son gave me a good piece of advice. He said that if you, and he was 10 at the time, so he knew his stuff. He said, if you are lucky enough to be successful on YouTube, it's because you found a lane. But if you stay in the lane too long, people are going to get bored and leave. But if you leave the lane first, they're going to leave because that's not why they're watching you. So you have to slowly expand your lane if you want to stay successful. It's like, okay, I, I, I didn't even know enough to understand the, the, those comments, but over the years I've lived by that. And the expansion of the lane that was very, very successful was starting to photograph my daughter. So I was doing photography content and she is a gymnast. So I was working her into the dance gymnastics challenges. And every time we would work together, we would get more engagement. And I, I kind of realized that there was this whole avenue open for a father-daughter kind of relationship on YouTube that nobody was doing. So I pivoted from doing photography to doing family content, but in a more unique way. There wasn't like the whole family interesting uh, absolutely you know i think it's very smart right to stay in the lane up until a certain point that start expanding right uh, instead of like neither jumping on any new trends or trying to do a thousand things at the same time right because then your identity as a sort of crisis uh, people that know you for something might be a bit confused and so you know again you said you started with that and then with your daughter family and so on now you do a lot of content right with your family and so you know first of all why do you think that a lot of people out there watch family content. Is it because uh, they feel like relatable to that type of content? Is it because it is very engaging and entertaining? Like, well, why do you think that is the reason why? It, it depends on the kind of content you're talking about. There, there's not one yeah. family genre because what we're, what we are appealing to is tween and teen girls along with their parents. So we're doing a co yeah. viewing audience experience kind of model almost a bit after Disney or Nickelodeon in terms of storytelling and production non. However, a lot of other family channels are catering to a much younger audience, maybe two to five, two to six, right? So that's a completely different reason why they're watching. I'd say for, for us and for other family channels that have a similar audience, it is relatable mixed with aspiration is probably why people watch. Like either the comments that we get a lot are either like you remind me of like Salish, my daughter, reminds me of my best friend, reminds me of my sister. She could be my friend. I'd love her to be my friend because it's a relatable thing. We, we shop in Target. We don't flex wealth. We don't have a massive house. So we keep our relationship with the audience very familiar. Another way to go is to make it very aspirational. You live in a huge house. You have a ton of money. And people watch this like, oh my yeah. God, I wish that was my life, right? So I think that, and, and I think that that's probably why I think a lot of times also parents and kids take inspirations from YouTube and go out and do the things themselves. They go to the water park, they go to the amusement park, they, they go do the fun challenges that the family does, and they're living vicariously through by watching. And the reason that YouTube has taken over Netflix and Hulu and every other streaming platform has become the number one streaming platform on television is because it's real life happening and it's much easier to connect with the people that you see on camera because they're real people as opposed to that. And since you said like, you know, real life, right? So again, very relatable, uh you know, your family, other families are watching. In your case, right, you said that other families can also recreate, right, maybe challenges, uh, games together with the family. But majority of the times it stays inside the family, it doesn't go live, right? In your case, instead, whenever you do something with the family, right, it goes live on YouTube. How was the process to getting from, like, we're just a family to work-related, right? Because at the end of the day, it's still creating content, it's scripting things. How is that? Was it natural? Was it a bit challenging? How did you, in case, like, you know, were able to solve anything that was like, hey, in this moment you are recording, it's business, it's work, let, let's do it properly. That's, that's the opposite of how we approach it. So there's two things. Uh, we are not a vlog champ. We don't film mm -hmm. our lives. We, uh, yeah. Salish made it very clear. She wants to be a kid six days a week and she wants to film one day. So the Monday through Friday, she goes to school all day. Then she goes to gymnastics all night. Mm -hmm. She hangs out with her friends on Saturday. She does gymnastics, maybe a sleepover or whatever. And we film on Sunday. So she separated out her life. So she isn't a YouTuber. She's a kid. And on Sunday, she does YouTube. And my goal when we film is to keep it as similar to any other day we're together as possible. We were just filming a video last week. And uh, somebody who's in the video has watched a lot of our videos. 
And she noticed that off camera, we were exactly the same as we are on camera, like the same exact banter and familiarity. And I feel like that's a very, very essential component. And it also is what makes it the most fun. But authenticity, an, a viewer can tell whether or not it's authentic. So we don't really stop and say, now we're working. I mean, obviously we have to get the video done and we got our plan to do so. But we really try to keep the banter very consistent with who we are. Hello, is your brand ready to amplify its reach? Well, the Influencer Marketing Factory is here to do just that. We are a global influencer marketing agency helping brands ignite their growth from influencer identification to campaign strategy, handling legalities and agreements to managing shipping and logistics. We have it all covered. We work with hundreds of brands across different verticals from Fortune 500 companies to DTC brands. And we don't just stop there. With detailed ROI analysis, we help brands like yours measure success, transforming impressions into actionable conversions. You can find us at the influencer marketing factory.com or just search the influencer marketing factory on Google. Now, especially these days, right? Where there is sometimes this sort of like, you know, gap between what you see online, right? And you think that a person is going to be, you know, also, you know, like funny and pathetic, like in person. And then many times, right? Fans get, uh, or there is maybe a scandal happening because the person in behind the camera is not the real person and so on. So right. I think that uh, when it comes to that, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's quite important. And, uh, so I wanted to ask you, so I saw that you guys are doing a lot of uh, short form content, of course, right? So usually uh, as of now, anytime that I talk with other YouTubers, uh, TikTokers and so on, but specifically YouTubers, uh, they are told me that there usually there is two types of content out there. Either the content that you just watch as a short video, like it starts and finish in the short, right? It's just like entertaining and that's about it. And other times instead you create uh, teasers, right? For the longer video. And so basically you use the short form to send traffic to, you know, the longer video. Um, are you trying to do both? Is mostly just to do, you know, solo videos on short form that is going to work by itself? Have you find any, like, you know, luck using that as a teaser to send it to the long form? Tell me a bit more about that. I feel like that can work for some people. We don't do that. And when we do shorts, we don't link it to a long form video. I'd yeah. say that we are very fortunate in the number of views we get and the conversion mm -hmm. from short to long is going to be so significant that it makes a difference. I do know that that is a good strategy to take a clip from a long form video turn it to a short to keep people back to your long you can definitely do that especially if that short goes viral for us I, I prefer to keep them independent so for shorts i'm trying to tell a short story and then for long form i'm trying to tell a long story one of the best benefits for me about shorts is a brand deal because yeah. we, we've got the point where we would much more we much prefer to do a brand deal on a short than a long form because with long form it's very hard to in incorporate the brand into storytelling. It's kind of like, a, we're trying to keep, make it feel like you're hanging out with us, right? So if in the middle of yeah. hanging out, I was to say, listen, you got to try this new video game, right? Like it's yeah. only 995 a month, but it's, it feels weird. So I think we average about 45 million views per short. And so we can pivot brand deals to the shorts and we have a much better chance of making those viral. And have you find like, a, is there like a ratio for you? Like, X amount of shorts uh, is going to be like just organic content, uh, no promotion. Uh, then like, have, have you found something there that works so that you don't annoy too much your audience, uh, but also you are able to monetize? We don't do shorts so regularly that we need that formula, but I would suggest if you're doing it regularly, you should do five organic for one brand. We got into a stretch lately where we just did brand deals, but we made them feel organic because it was a fun concept. So it was entertaining anyway. And so we, but, but I'd say five to one. And what do you think that is the best way, again, to make a content that is promoted, uh, but you still want to watch and potentially also you want to share to others, right? Because that's one of the metrics that matter the most when it comes to an ad. And people say like, oh, wow, this is a great ad. I share with friends or with my family. Have you found like a formula? Is there like a, a common, demon you know, something there that, that works all the time or it depends? I think the way we do it is we look at what works for us anyway with, when we're doing organic content. And then we try to figure out a way to do a short brand deal with that same approach. So for example, one thing that's worked really well for us is guess my age went a hundred dollars. Guess my daughter's age went a hundred dollars. Those have gotten like a hundred million views. And wow. so then when we did a, a brand deal and so Salish is a bit old to be playing with dolls, but there was a doll company that wanted to do a brand deal. So what we did is we set up a, uh, oh, it was a doll that could do nails. So we set up a thing on Santa Monica Pier, which are you willing to put your hand in this, in this hole? We mm, joke yeah, that so that right? And what it is, is it's a nail makeover and then it becomes mm -hmm. the brand at the very end. So you didn't know until the end of the video that you were watching a brand deal. You just thought you were wondering what's in that hole and yeah. who's willing to put their hand in it. 
And at the end, you realize, oh, this is a brand deal. By the time you realize that you're already watching it again. And that did very well for them. And also, so I would say incorporate the brand in a creative way and don't start your short by saying it's a brand deal. You might have to put a little graphic on the top to, to comply with regulations. But other than that, tell the story and then work the brand into that story. On top of this, so if we don't look at, for a second, at only promoted posts, but let's say any other content, so long form content that you usually post, how long does it take, you know, from thinking about the concept, uh, script it, all the editing, the publishing. Uh, is there like, have you found a range of hours more or less ballpark? Uh, is it more like, tell me a bit more about that because I, f I find it all the time fascinated that people that don't do this for a, for a living, right. they think there's, oh, it's a nice video, 10 minutes, uh, whatever. And then there is hours, uh, sometimes days, if not weeks of preparation. Right. So how does it work for you? Everybody's different, right? A good friend mm -hmm. of mine has a family channel. They do vlogging. So they spend a few hours, mm -hmm. a couple times a week and that's it. We're different. I always wanted to make it seem like a television show, but more like reality television meets uh, Disney. So that requires production. Fortunately, Sandy, um, my production partner, is uh, a cinematographer from New York. So we uh, have a big production. We have four cameras for every shoot. We have 10 audio tracks. We have five PAs running around. We try to keep it simple because you don't want to make it about that, but it looks really good, sounds really good because of production. However, because we only film one day a week, we have to do a very quick turnaround because we're also consistent. Every Saturday we post, we have for years. We never miss 7 a.m. Saturday, which I think, by the way, if anybody's listening, is one of the biggest keys to success on social media is consistency. And I've found that once a week, Saturday morning is our, is our time block. Like if you were watching Friends and suddenly Thursday night at 8.30 and you turned on and they weren't there, that wouldn't make any sense. They wouldn't skip, mm -hmm. right? So that's how I see it. So... We film on Sunday and post the following Saturday. So our schedule is crazy because Saturday, a Sunday after we film, he sends all the content to a New York editor who works all night and all next day to sync everything. And by Tuesday, Sandy is starting to edit. Has to be done by Saturday. It's, it's like three or four 12-hour days in a row. Meanwhile, we are also in pre-production for the shoot that we're doing on Sunday. So that's the only way we can get these videos turned around. Sandy. Wow. Seems quite crazy, right? Like to think that everything has to be kind of crowded, like, you know, and air rushed everything in, in one week. So, you know, top of it also, like we, we said, right, all the editing, the post-production is very important, but something crucial and you know better than anyone else there with all these subscribers that you have, the importance of also thumbnails, right? Uh, on YouTube, right? One of the main factors for click-through rate. Uh, let's go a bit more into that. So finally, you know, YouTube, right? It is... Uh, Experiment a bit more with the A-B testing when it comes to thumbnails. So first of all, how do you approach thumbnails? So was it something for you easy to crack the code on? Have you found like a sort of formula for you as well, like on that? And number two, are you using the A-B testing feature from YouTube? And if so, are you actually finding like any, is it useful for you? So I would like to understand a bit more the process there, right? Do you just create a couple of them that's it? Or do you do like other creators that create hundreds of them and then they do all these A-B testing uh, for the first day up until they understand what works or what doesn't. Do you have an audience of creators? I mean, do a lot of people listen more than creators? Majority is like marketers, brand marketers, but also content creators. Listening. So it's it's a bit of a mix and that's why I think it's uh, also would be interesting for okay. both of them to understand a bit more about that. So the dive into the weeds of thumbnails briefly. Yes, I do the A-B testing. It's actually A-B-C testing really because you get three yeah. options. I do that and, and we will go with whatever one YouTube tells us to do. However, usually it's incremental difference. If you have a thumbnail uh, and then you have a similar thumbnail with a different shirt or something, it doesn't really change the views. But what does is if you have different strategies about the video altogether, like if you can package the video in more than one way and it's still accurate to the video and then you change. So for example, let's say my daughter, she has a best friend. Let's say she's gone for the year and he comes back for the summer. And they do a hide and seek in a water park. This is the video we actually did. The title could be hide and seek in a water park. Or it could be my daughter's best friend moves back home. Completely different approach to that. We did my daughter's best friend moves back home, assuming that once the core audience was done watching it, we would move it to hide and seek in a water park, which is more of a universal title and might appeal to viewers who didn't know what they are. But my best friend moves back home stayed successful and has continued to stay successful. So we just left that more emotional, personal title 
And then the thumbnail is just the two of them hugging. Whereas if it was hide and seek in a water park, it would be more of an AI generated thing with her looking and me walking back. So, so if you're looking to make a difference in your views based on thumbnail title, have a secondary definition of the video altogether. Just make sure that that's accurate. Don't change the title to something that doesn't happen in the video. Yeah. People will feel clickbaited and they'll stop working. How do you get better? Because like a, a, a thumbnail, because and also titles, right? I feel there is a, almost an art, right? To master it. Is it like watching other videos? It is understanding the behavior and the psychology of users. Like how much science is happening when it comes to title and thumbnail? And how do you, how can you get better in that? The way that we often do it, the most successful way to do it is when we come up with the concept that we think we're going to film, I reach out to my sketch artist. My son introduced me to her because he also has a YouTube channel. His name's Hudson Matter, by the way. And he has them sketch out the thumbnail, so we do the same. So we say an idea. We say, you know, daughter survives world's worst bullet. And then she would give us a bunch of sketches for thumbnails. Once we have those sketches, we work on those until we like them. Then we take that photo, and then we send it to the... On the day of the shoot, we take the photo, we send it to the thumbnail designer the next day. So it's good to kind of have an idea of what you're going to do. It's, it's interesting because I would say it's an 80-20 split. I'd say 80% of the success of a video is concept, meaning thumbnail and title. And 20% is execution, yeah. meaning did you make a good video? But yet we spend 95% of our time on the 20% of success. So we spend most of our time thinking yeah. about the execution and not enough time spending on the thumbnail and title. And that's pretty consistent over most YouTubers. They just don't spend as much time as they should on the thing that matters most. Fascinating. Yes, if you, then you can also share something about you know the sketch process. That would be uh, great to see the behind the scene. I have a last question for you, Jordan, today, and it is that: What is like? Is there anything very exciting for you in the future of all this creator economy? Something that you are like looking at uh, that might maybe other people are not really closely pay attention to. I would say, in terms of content, there's the trend is towards much longer videos, which allows you for more podcasting and and like kind of more casual we've hit this i think by the peak of the mr beast era which is the yeah. gamification and challenge base of everything not that he's going anywhere anytime soon but i'm saying that i think now there's a swing back towards more intimate vlog style longer slower videos that people can just turn and watch or relax and then also i would say storytelling and scripted content will also be very big moving forward so uh, Darman is a great example of somebody who's created, he's a good friend, a huge production yeah. studio. He's like his own production company now. And I would say more and more people will probably start doing more scripted content. So those are the two things that I see happening, longer videos. Fantastic. And uh, do you think, the last question on, on that, you know, it's just a little follow-up. Uh, what do you think that instead uh, should not be happening anymore in the creator economy? Is there something that you, that you, that you hope to see differently in the future? In terms of content, it's gotten a little comical in terms of how much everybody's repurposing everybody else's content. It's kind of like, you know, like yeah. same title, same thumbnails, same same script sometimes. I mean, I've seen, and we've done videos where people literally use the same props, they've bought, gone and bought the same wow. thing and used, and it's, so it's gotten to the point where it's, it's not inspiration anymore. It's like flat out copying. So I would like to see people... And it's good because because the way algorithms, the way YouTube's algorithm works is it encourages you to do that in a way because it knows the, the recommended engine knows if I title something world's biggest water park and somebody else does, YouTube shares those two. So it's, it helps you if you do that. I would love people to find their own unique voice and creativity. And the biggest thing is, why are you doing this? What is the purpose behind why you're doing it? Are you trying to inspire? Are you trying to make people envious? Are you trying to just make money? whatever it is. I think there's a huge opportunity in YouTube for creators to build something outside of YouTube, right? Either repurposing their content or selling products, or whatever, but not as much as people think. I don't think there's that many Mr. Beasts out there sure. who have a legions of millions that are ready to buy anything. But if you do it right, and if you focus on what people already understand about you, you create a product that's consistent with who you are. That's also a great opportunity because you start with so many eyeballs that if you give them the right product, and if you're giving back though, if you're just selling to your audience to make money, I don't agree, but if you're giving them something that would be of value to them, I think it's a great opportunity. Absolutely, totally agree, and great piece of advice there.
Jordan, thank you so much for joining me today. And congratulations on all the achievements that you got so far, all the numbers, all the videos, uh, and all these lives, right, that you said, like the actors, the photography, YouTubers. Uh, let's see what is next, right? I'm very curious uh, to see what is next. Uh, but again, thank you so much for joining me today. This was the Influence Factor by the Influencer Marketing Factory, and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.